Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back after a good lunch. Um, what Brian talked about uh, in the morning was very important. Folklore. Why folklore? There is a memory behind that folklore because it is handed down from generation to generation. When there was no written word, when there was no written letter, folklores were important to maintain traditions of communities, of tribals and other indigenous people that did not have the letter to. We have evolved to have letters and have scientific analytical capabilities, yet we keep failing. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is about medicine. Uh, with, I start with an apology to Ian. I was supposed to send it, but uh, I do have his permission to present this. We're supposed to do it jointly. Um, this lecture is normally about two hours. I'll stop whenever the chair stops me and make a few points. Again, when you look at medicine and emergency medicine, historically we have evolved over the last 60, 70 years only. Modern medicine is not too old. We did not have any of the things that we have today earlier. It is only recent. And your ambulance is, of course, the creation of a surgeon from here only. Battlefield. Napoleon's surgeon did it in his battlefield, and today, tactical combat casualty care, teaching us from war experiences in Iraq, Afghanistan, Middle East, wherever war is happening, it is teaching us what should be the trauma guidelines. But there is another battlefield in the civilian roads here that is being used by civilian urban people to take care of the victims. And what we do here is something that needs to be analyzed carefully. And medicine, like folklore, passed from one generation to the another, most often works hierarchically. It is only recently that the trend is changing. And increasingly, without questioning, we do things. We do things intuitively, we do things uh, by experience and empiricisms. What difference does all that we do to the patient in the field to change his outcome after the injury is what we need to look at and look at the hard evidence on that. Can we save all the patients? And how do we go, in, go about saving maximum number of patients? So that's the historical things, just key things that came up. For example, the CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the, the resuscitative maneuver that we do is only in 61 that we started having it. Um, the intravenous fluids <coughs> is in 60s, mid 60s for trauma care, it's mid 60s as a substitute for blood. Uh, the CT scan is only 80s. Can't think of a polytraumatized patient going through emergency care without CT scans. We just very, very recent in our understanding. And 90s, we started looking at hypotensive resuscitation, <coughs> but did not come in as a protocol. But the patient, once he's injured, you have a whole spectrum of care, not compartmentalized, but as a continuum of care. Protocols have evolved on this, the advanced trauma life support system, the pre-hospital trauma life support system, the medical component of that goes as advanced life support system, essentially pushed by the cardiologists and the physicians and the basic life support systems, all again in the last 40-50 years, nothing before that. And the key components relate to the ABC of resuscitation and control of bleeding, protecting the spine in shifting the patient and transporting the injured to the hospital. The science of medicine has been evolving and a lot of technology has evolved and a lot of people are using technology to change this. For example, the unified number 
in today's world we can have a unified number overnight for the entire country but the political will to get that done has not been happening across nations especially low and middle income countries like for example my country has been promising it for the last 20 years hasn't happened it's just one little technical thing which is done but we have no uniform num number in internationally and we do not have unified numbers in many of the low and middle income countries because that is your access to emergency care and speed is emphasized to get early care yes but do we know the signs of how fast to get to a definitive care facility is there any randomized control trial to say that okay this is the time this is optimum this is safe this is not safe can we response time is used as a indirect measure of efficiency of care but does that give you the true efficiency of care those are questions that are asked and in different wars the the transportation times have been changing from one first world war to vietnam war the transportation times have changed but everything else also has changed so you need to look at the big picture the small picture is transportation time the big picture is antibiotics came in anesthesia became safer trauma care became different so we have the whole thing so today if you have this when can you get a transport in a for a patient who is injured to a hospital even in this that is the question that we should be able to answer and when would you need this we still don't have right answers for this the whole concept of first star safety golden hour safety was not based on evidence it was based on verbal rhetoric of a president of american college of surgeons giving his presidential oration and he wanted to use a dramatic statement to highlight the importance of early care that's all right but then how early and how late is it safe and how early is absolutely important this is a paper by brook learner who has shown very clearly how the whole concept of golden hour came about completely uh, nothing to do with evidence based medicine it is only a verbal rhetoric ambulances of course so we have seen today morning also we a vehicle passed by with flashing lights and sirens we have to understand does it make the ambulance reach faster to get the patient to the goal within that golden hour as they say there was a study done by richard hunt he looked at 50 consecutive trips one call two ambulances sent one with flashing lights and sirens other without the mean time saving was only about 40 seconds not too much of a difference critically so they can be dangerous why because it gives the driver of the vehicle quite a false sense of safety he'll drive faster if you've sat in an ambulance you'll realize how scared you are when you're sitting in the ambulance and going with the driver they really move fast so the 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 evalu evaluation of this did not happen till very recently so there are papers on this is 2003 higher incidence of fatal crashes in medicine we have key concept primum non nocere primarily do no harm so if in an attempt to save patients you are actually killing people you are you are violating the hippocratic oath that we are supposed to take and all this is based only on the feeling that it should be fast and therefore you should go all the way go rocket speed and get in there and get the patient there but at the cost of you know risking lives so when you look at evidences on this the non ems patients the survival and outcomes are no different from the ems ambulance transported patients this is my own country my own city two different studies two different time frames 89 versus 2004 the number of patients transported to ambulance were only 4% 3% initially 3% initially then 4% uh, yet a lot of them reached within the first hour without any ambulance service so it is possible to get them and then you have to look at are the outcomes different but there's no randomized control trial there's no study on this to look at that and again considering speed this is something which is pushed very emotional politicians love it uh, many countries have it but when you look at the transportation does it actually change the survival if you look at papers the actual survival of patients do not really <coughs> change most of them are done emotionally yes but far out areas very far flung areas remote areas 
out on the sea, there are ways when you need to do it, but by and large, they transport only minor injured patients. By and large, they are the most unsafe transportation system in the world. Uh, look at the crashes that are there, 139 crashes in a 14 year period in the US, 120 killed, 146 seriously injured. It's, it's really unsafe to transport, particularly at night, particularly in urban setting. Rural areas, distant areas, open areas are different, but at night in urban areas, it's one of the most uh, unsafe situations. The cardiopulmonary resuscitation has evolved until 2009 when the circulation, that's the journal that came out with the paper on this, the guidelines. Earlier, mouth to mouth resuscitation. How many of you here know CPR? It's a small number. I expected a much more number. Yeah. So, you have mouth to mouth resuscitation along with chest compressions. In 2009, they came out with the conclusion that you can manage without the mouth to mouth resuscitation. Did that come out because the pure science? No. There are a lot of hesitation in people doing mouth to mouth resuscitation in the 90s. So there was, a, there was a lot of researchers which started looking at can we do it without it and it came out of the fact that you can do just with chest compression, the air that goes in with just chest compression is sufficient for oxygenation of your blood that is there for artificial breathing. So again technology plays a role here, I think it's working, is it working? No. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They have an automatic <coughs> machine that takes over the human compression that is there. Then you look at the evaluation of it. Mechanical CPR may actually worsen neurological outcome in many of these patients. So what seems good may not actually be doing good. So that's what we need to understand in medicine. Unless you have the evidence uh, base, it's very difficult to you know, dismiss or accept both ways. Again, we are having more devices now, technology to come in, in, in ITDs, impedance threshold devices to increase the capacity of the lungs to expand. So that's what is coming up and the whole concept of CPR is changing from 1960 when it evolved to today, 2010, it's almost 40 years to take to evolve to a different level of understanding. So all these things that are listed here are new things completely different from what was understood earlier. So medicine is evolving, yes. So even when correctly applied, even if we know how to do it, the chances of the people surviving and reaching the hospital setting in an alive condition are quite, quite remote. In fact, in one study they found that uh, 9 out of 10, they did not make it. In another trauma patients, most of them, this report study that the outcome is very poor in these CPR patients. Um, modern technology again, communication, dispatcher assisted first responder to look at how you can care for the victim by telephonic communication using telemedicine. Has it made a difference? No. It did not many make any difference versus simple bystander picking up and transporting the patient. Again, looking at basic life support versus advanced life support, the techniques that we evolve and do in advanced life support, Cochrane review uh, of which Ian was a part of it, uh, doesn't suggest that there is no any benefit in having advanced life support for these victims. Basic life support does as well, not just experimental. Major field studies looking at serious injuries, particularly in the injury severity score more than 15, they found that the outcome was no different with pre-hospital um, advanced life support versus, versus basic life support. Two recent studies again very clearly document that advanced life support are less likely to expect experience the neuro neurological functioning that is good compared to the basic life support. They do better. The basic life support patients clearly do better than advanced life support patients in the setting that we are giving ALS versus non-ALS because there are ambulances that do advanced life support, there are ambulances that do basic life support doing the minimum intervention. So they found that doing the advanced technology, their advanced interventions did not change the outcome. Actually, the outcome was poorer in the ones who had the advanced intervention. The American <coughs> College of Surgeons, again bleeding is one major denominator for poor outcome in, in trauma victims. When they looked at the various parameters that are done, other than digital control, direct pressure, not much has really changed. 
their war situation has brought in two Nikkis, which were condemned earlier in seven wars, is being recommended increasingly. But it must be recommended only with the caveat that there has to be a supervised Nikki only. Otherwise, this general recommendation, again, look at the recommendation. It says strength of recommendation is weak, quality of evidence is low. But the recommendation is coming from the American College of Surgeons. So, though we don't have all the hard evidence, we are still pushing for things to make sure that it gets followed. Volume loss of blood, again, should we replace volume? How much of volume should we should do? Till 2008, the recommendation was <coughs> the IV fluids, which replace the volume loss of blood in a trauma victim, are essential for every patient who is injured. So, that's one of the first things. Putting in an IV cannula in a trauma victim is one of the first things that is done for a trauma patient. And when <coughs> the protocols were there, just two major sites below the diaphragm and one above the diaphragm. Um, large bore cannulas being inserted by above and below to take care of vena caval ruptures above and bleeding into the abdomen below. So that is uh, what was done, what is recommended. Though papers were coming on this way back in 70s, but it took 80s, 90s, almost whole of the first uh, decade of 2000 to get the thing changed to balanced permissive hypertension. This is the, the <coughs> European recommendation now on guidelines for major bleeding. The recommendation very clearly talks about volume replacement is advocated permissive hypertension until bleeding is controlled. The critical thing in a trauma victim is control the bleeding and then only do the volume replacement. Otherwise, you are actually it will likely to cause more harm. Again, another key thing that we do in pre-hospital care is protecting the spines, the spine boards, the cervical collars. When we look at paper after paper, I am only quoting two of them, paper after paper talk about the lack of evidence in showing any benefit for spinal immobilization <laughs> of these patients. Um, the neurological outcomes are not changing despite spinal immobilization. In fact, there is a paper which talks <coughs> about worsening outcomes after the collars have been applied in these patients. Medications, most of them that are being used are painkillers. You give painkillers, you give narcotics to take care of pain management in these patients. The only medicine which has come about which is changing things is tranexamic acid. It is recognized widely now. The CRASH-2 trial very specifically created, generated a body of evidence which is high quality, not low quality compared to the previous one which is being used. High quality evidence has been generated, particularly when there is any delay in the patient getting definitive care for the hospital sitting. Available data clearly support the use of transistic acid and even in pediatric patients they are finding. Though initially ex fears were expressed on the quality uh, and the problems that could be associated with giving a drug which could encourage clot coagulation in these bleeding patients. It encourages coagulation and sealing off of wounds that are bleeding. So it reduces the bleeding and reduces the blood loss and therefore improves the survival. So they found that even in pediatric patients, even in elderly patients, the results are pretty good. So it has been recommended to be introduced in certain part of US also and in UK in ambulance services, uh, Southwest UK ambulance service has been in introduced. Um, but by and large, if you look at all that is done in an ambulance, most of it is except for one or two recommendations are all consensus based. And consensus based could be skewed because of bias, because of conflict of interest, because of what the sur surgeons agree upon or disagree upon. So it, it could be a problem in that. Um, there is little scientific evidence on lot of components that we do in the pre-hospital setting that can change the outcome for the patient. So very little scientific evidence of what we do. To make valid conclusions, you must have well-controlled, prospective, randomized controlled trials. And that is the gold standard for medicine. Uh, right from the time when um, um, Cochrane started writing about this, we have to understand evidence-based medicine in the 90s came up in a big way. However, in emergency medicine, because of the, the emergent nature of the injury and the emotions that are associated with it and the public 
reasoning about general feeling that is there is that it, it is unethical to do this kind of a research uh, in pre-hospital setting. So there is a risk that is there in most people's mind that you know you can't do randomized controlled trial in these patients. So what all do you control? It's difficult. Okay. Um, policy, again, the European Union directive on this, uh, you have to take special consent. You can't assume consent because they have come to uh, an emergency setting. So there are some recommendations for changing this, but it hasn't really changed. The European guidelines are very clear on this. Um, given the nature of the empirical evidence, developing countries should be encouraged to adopt pre-hospital trauma care system. That is a, at the policy level, that's a recommendation that is coming up in Journal of Trauma and all. But if you really see what should make a difference is the hospital care. Getting the patient from the roadside to the hospital. Unless the hospital is competent and has the capacity, human resource as well as otherwise, to take care of the patient, it's not going to make a difference. So advances in hospital care have to be going before advances in pre-hospital care or they should go concurrently. Otherwise, you are shifting deaths from roadside to bedside. Nothing else will change. So the team concept evolved in 90s. Uh, UK trauma team, this is 90s paper. But recently, we had our Supreme Court directive asking us to look at how we can improve trauma care in India. So one of the questions that asked was, where every state was supposed to respond? Trauma team concept, is it being practiced in your just one minute. Is it in practice in your hospital? Many of the the hospital came back and said, what is a trauma team? So though it is there, it is 20, 25 years old now, they are not uh, really implementing it. So how many hospitals are trauma teams? Just really not understood. And polytrauma patients especially need multi-speciality hospital, which has tertiary care capacity to take care of these victims. Unless you have these it is not going to work and how many low and middle income countries have that and again lastly but not the least increasingly governments in these countries are having privatization of healthcare, corporatization of healthcare and once there is corporatization of healthcare <coughs> the public hospital cannot take care of tertiary care problems all the technology all this the competent doctors are moved out to corporate hospitals and they are not available for the poor patient going to these public hospitals and trauma victims have to have Imagine care, so you don't worry about insurance, you don't worry about money, you can't have the complex injured patients going to these places. Most of them are poor, unskilled labor, in a study done by me um, as uh, part of ICMR survey, survey on healthcare done by Mao Hospital. Most of them are on subsistence economy of existence, and a lot of them spend so much money as part of their monthly. Uh, expenditure on healthcare. The moment they have a trauma, it becomes a catastrophic healthcare. They get indebted for not just one generation, two generation, or more. So, impact of privatization, we still do not know. There's an attrition, and important to understand that we need to recognize the need to improve hospital care as much as to get the patient quickly to a definitive care facility. Um, let's stop here in uh, urban areas with reasonable mechanism to get them to a definitive care facility. It's safe to transport them by scoop and run and get them to a hospital which can give them tertiary care as soon as they reach there and give them all that is required. So I'll just stop here. Thank you very much.